Folks, welcome to a special impromptu edition of the Jake Feinberg Show. And uh, today I'm joined by one Daniel Ray, who earned the name Big Black as one of the most prodigious African drummers that this country or the world has ever seen. We've been talking for the last 20 minutes off the air about the politics of the music industry, which has really never changed. The loyalty of the brotherhood within the industry that had a struggle with making a living and feeding mouths. And ultimately, what is not just the legacy of these titans, but what can they do in the future to propel music and get musicians paid for it? Black, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you. You know, tell me... I want, you said you earned that name Big Black. Earning something in our society is not what it used to mean. You earned that name because you learned from some serious titans. Please talk about some of your mentors. Well, I only had uh, two mentors. One was my brother, and the other was his partner. They were a team. And uh, my brother's name was Fish Ray. His partner's name was Johnny Ingram. Fish and Slick, they were called. They were known for their great drumming, and they were they were all around entertainers. You know what I'm saying? Dancers, drummers, they did everything. Sure. Anyway, they became my mentors because everything they did took on a form that made it made people happy. And uh, the style that I play was created by them. I naturally took it to a different level because they're gone, I'm still here, and I'm still working it even now to this day. But uh, I've had a chance to study and put together the whole concept that they were coming from based on their travels. And, 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 and the route to which they took in order to learn the things that they did. They were my mentors. And they were great drummers. And I was learning to play, you know, like uh, in the early days when I was learning to play. And um, they didn't allow me to play with them because I wasn't good enough. I was only allowed to squat, you know. They encouraged me to just keep listening. You know, they didn't teach me nothing. They didn't show me how to do nothing. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about it in the early days. I just, I was just fascinated with the way they played. And every time uh, they were around me anywhere within walking or running distance, I'd be there listening to what they're playing. And, um, as time progressed, I got better and better at what I did. And uh, when I got good enough, I was given the name Big Black. Where Where did you grow up? I grew up in Florida. On the west side of Florida, in Tampa? No, 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 no. Miami. So... The city in the USA. You know... Talk a so uh, I guess my, my the logical question is at what point did they say Daniel you are now ready here's your drum here, here's a drum you play with us or no no, no 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 this took place in the Bahamas right I had uh, I I had I had I had I had moved away from Florida to the Bahamas Nassau Bahamas that's why a lot of people thought I was from Nassau. But I was, I was from, I was from, actually, I was from Georgia, living in Florida. And I left Florida and moved to the Bahamas. And while I was down there, there was a lot going on with Haitian drumming and the Bahamian drumming. You know what I'm saying? So I was in an environment where drumming was prevalent. And drummers were like, like, like the lead performers in the nightclub. See what I'm saying? So I went down, I had a German buddy down there that owned a club. A German and a G 
Pugh and Leo Ross. Leo Ross and Don Siler. Don Siler, Don Siler was a sculptor. And, and, and he did all the building. And he built the, the, the Black Bears Tavern for Leo Ross. And across the street, he built the Jean Canoe Club, where I became the star attraction. And I, I played there at the Jean Canoe Club for several years with Don and Leo and developed my art. You understand? Know and uh, after about five years of developing this art, my brother and his partner came to the Bahamas. By this time, I was like, you know, you know, like star the ghetto. Sure. I was, I was, I was, I was one of the top drummers in NASA at that time, next to the great drummers like Tina Taylor and uh, and the uh, oh, I can't think of some of these guys' names, but I was, I became one of the guys there. Black and my it, brother and his partner came in one night to hear me play. They hadn't heard me in about five years since I had left Miami and moved to the Bahamas. And I made them fall off of their seat. <laughs> <laughs> and that night, they were all laughing. They were so happy after my show. And my brother came up to me and grabbed me on the shoulder and said, Big Black, you bad motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> At that point, that's when the name, you got the name, or you had the name before that. That's when I became Big Black. You're versed in all these different rhythms i mean and you had down in, in the bahamas you had you had steel drums they had the goombe they had the goombe can you talk about that and then they they had all the haitian rhythm you know what i'm saying the the bolero the dino floor that 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 was created by tuowo right tuowo was a great drummer he created the dino floor um and in Haiti, they played a rhythm called um, Bolero. The Bahamas, they had the Goombe. And the Goombe is, is, is very similar to the carnival style drumming of um, Brazil and Trinidad and all the other islands. But like black in Africa, like like all of the different tribes you go to, they are, they each are playing the same rhythm. And they each got a, different, a slightly different spin on the rhythm. You know what I'm saying? And that's how it is in the, throughout the Caribbean. The rhythms are similar, but every island has its own spin. That's that whole pride thing that goes into the individual culture that they're trying to project. You, you make your name in the Bahamas, and then... At that point, you went back to the southeast part of the United States in Georgia and Florida, or did you go to New York after that? Well, I lived in when I left the Bahamas, I went to New York. And you and you linked up with uh, and and talk a little bit about uh, linking up with some of the guys like Dizzy, who who felt it was imperative to or was you know. With, well, I, when, when I went to when I went to New York, um, one of the first people I met. Um, well, I, I started out. I started out playing when I first went to New York at a place called the the African Room with a with a folk singer named Johnny Barracuda. Wow! And we used to do a show. I used to play with Johnny. We did. We had a, a semi comedy act. We did doing extemporaneous calypso, me playing rhythm, and just having fun with the audience because a lot of tourists came into this place, the African Room on 44th Street in New York. And uh, we had Lester Wilson. I don't know if you ever heard of him. He was a great dancing choreographer. 
get all that stuff for um, for um, John Travolta and Saturday Night Fever. Right. All that da- all that dance routine of the uh, where 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 Travolta that dance that Travolta sure. Lester choreograph all of that stuff. Wow. Anyway, we were working in the African room. Lester Wilson, uh, Richie Haven. You heard of him? Absolutely. Chief Bay. Absolutely. I just, I, it's funny, I just found a record, co, co, uh, Conga Percussion on Pirouette, Chief Bay, and his All Stars. Hey, send me a copy of that. I will say, you know, get, you give me your address, I'll, I'll fire that out to you immediately because the Chief Bay that I know was with Ray Mantia playing with Herbie Mann at the Village Gate. The only one Chief Bay. That's the Chief Bay who played with Herbie Mann. That's right, I know, Chief. Chief B is the only kind of drummer that a heavy man would use. Any other drummer besides Chief B wasn't a drummer for heavy man. <laughs> <laughs> See, because Herbie had, Herbie had gone to Africa and hung out in the hut with, with the natives down there and heard the pure shit, excuse my language. It's all right. And that's what Chief was into. Although Chief was from Georgia. <laughs> wow. I thought that Chief B was from Africa. He was my homeboy. Oh, I man. Oh, man. <laughs> I'll send you that record, Big Black. You got, you got my word on that. That It's a smoking record. Early, picture, early pictures of him, too. I found this in a thrift store for 50 cents. It was, uh, it, was a, it was a major find. What? Man, that's a treasure. Please send me a copy of that. Well, it's not, I got my one piece of vinyl. I'll send it. I, you know, it's just fine with me. I mean, you and Chief go way back to the days. You know, what was it about... Talk about growing up, you know, just the, the, talk about banging drums to the point where you're, you, you were cutting your hands, the calluses, the, the, just the kind of, you know, when, when I read liner notes from Hurry Man oh, albums. Well, now, now you're talking about going back to the early days. The early days, when I, when I, when I first moved to, to Florida, it was in the 19, 19, around 1953. I was, uh, I was about 16, 17 years old, 16 years old. And uh, I lived in a neighborhood where that was dangerous like all the neighborhoods in Miami in those days. Good Bread Alley. Got a place called Good Bread Alley. <laughs> was the home of all the hoodlums and killers and thieves. That's Good Bread Alley. And I lived only blocks away from there. But, um, I had a partner named George Marshall. We used to get together and play every day. We didn't work for nobody. We didn't do nothing but play. That's all we did. Play the music. We ought to have time to eat. Anyway, I had a job after a while. Because if you want drums, you got to work to get the money unless you go out and steal it. And I was never a thief. So I got a job. I was 17 years old. Working for uh, a Jewish chap named Artie Steinhardt. He had a place on Miami Beach called the, I think it was called the Sun Motel. Mm-hmm. And I was working for Mr. Steinhardt at the Sun Motel. You know, spraying for the mosquitoes in the evening and uh, covering out the maids and cleaning up and whatever. I was just a general cat there. And uh, I'll never forget, I was making, I was working part-time. I was making $20 a week. Because the weekly pay at that time was about 40 bucks. Unbelievable. I was making 20 bucks a week working part-time. And I bought my first set of drums working on that gig with Mr. Steinhouse. I later came back and played for him in his club. He had a club called the Malayan Lounge was on the hippie clubs on Miami Beach. And he brought in music from uh, from Hawaii. 
And it was there that I learned to play Hawaiian rhythm from a, a great drummer from Hawaii named Johnny Pineapple. He was a drummer and dancer. And he had a group of dancers called Kalani Dancers. And there was a show at um, Malayan Lounge along with my brother and his group, Calypso Eddie, with uh, Bahama Mama the dancer. It was a Calypso and a, and a, and a um, Hawaiian show. Hawaiian dancers. Calypso dancer, Calypso drumming. It was great. It was a great show. Did you... Did, anyway, no, I was a yeah. youngster. I was just learning, and I was allowed to come into play. One night when Johnny, Johnny was uh, missing his drummer, he asked me what I played. And he showed me the rhythm. And I went out and played. And I went out getting a seat there. Although I never got paid, the sign out never paid me. He owed me to this day. He died without paying me. Anyway, that was one of my first club experiences. After that, I began to play with Calypso Eddie because the law came Law Sea and my brother and his partner went with the Law Sea ensemble out of Jamaica. They became a big hit back in 1957. And uh, I wound up working with the old group Calypso Eddie, me, Calypso Eddie, and Sam Roll, we had a trio. We went to Chicago, we played the, uh, the Blue Angel in Chicago. Uh, stayed there for half a winter with Gene Parsley. Uh, we moved back to Miami, went to the Bahamas. I got out down there for a while, played, had a good time. I played mostly with Calypso groups growing up, you know? Absolutely. And I didn't get into the whole uh, uh, jazz scene until after I had gone to the Bahamas and lived down there for a while. Got married, had a couple of kids. And one day I got on the plane and flew to New York. And, uh, At that time, it's when I, around the time when I met Randy Weston. And I met Randy because I had another buddy. He and I had opened a little room up in Harlem. And uh, Bill Saunders was part of my own father. Bill Saunders used to come back and play for me. Uh, and it was during the time when the music, well, most of the music was taking place in the downtown area of Manhattan. And they always wanted to bring the music uptown. It was one of our one of our motivations for starting something up there. So we rented one of those small band bedrooms and turned it into a, a spot for music. Called it the African Bag. And Randy Weston and Ray Bryant and all the cats started coming down. It's called the African Bag? Randy. And when, 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 when the club finally went to pump, I got a call from Randy. I started playing with Randy Weston. And I played with Randy over a period of about oh, 10 years, off and on. Then I met Dizzy. I played with Dizzy. And I played with Ray Bryan, and I recorded with different cats. And I met Freddie Hubbard somewhere along the way. I met Miles Davis. And all the cats. You know what I'm saying? Eric Dalby. All of them, Charlie Mingus, met them all. Didn't play with all of them, but um, had a personal encounter with all of them that's memorable. How you went from doing a lot of uh, Calypso drumming and, and, and doing a lot of you know shows, entertainment by yourself, and then having to fit into uh, having to fit in the 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 percussion into a, uh, a quartet or a quintet in a jazz setting with Dizzy. I mean, there's some nice clips on YouTube, but just from a technique point of view and also like a spiritual point of view, how did you, did you work well within the group? I never had a problem with working well with anybody. Everybody that I've played with, I seem to have taken 
something to their music that they needed. You know what I'm saying? Yep. And I'll tell you something about artists. If, you, if, you, if you're not bringing something to their music that they like or that their music needs, they'll let you know it. You know? Absolutely. And I've never been told, hey, man, step out. No. It's always, hey, man, play more. Give me a little more of this or that. You know what I'm saying? So, everybody that I've played with, I enjoyed playing with them, and I'm hoping they enjoyed playing with these much because otherwise they wouldn't have hired me. Like I said, from Ray Bryant to Randy Weston. I started out playing with, mainly with, with a lot of um, solo pianists, you know? That was one of the things that I believe was uh, responsible for the way I play to this day from playing with solo piano players. You know, Randy Weston and I have traveled all over the world doing solo. You know, he being a solo pianist with me, accompanying him. Just the two of us. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely no, and, and yeah, no. I want to. I want to ask you how how you know the the, the sexy stories, uh, or you know, from a historical point of view, it's always about George Shearing and Birdland, Armando Peraza, the, uh, you know, the Afro-Cuban rhythms, and I just that's why one of the reasons I really wanted to talk to you is so you could carve I out. Remember, I remember. I remember once I tried to get in touch with George Shearing because I liked the music he was doing. And he and S. Montgomery used to get together. The Montgomery brothers used to play with him. Sure. I, I grew up listening to a lot of that stuff, you know. When I finally got to New York, I remember once I called him George Sherry. And uh, I told him who I was. And I told him my name was Big Black Man. He insulted me. <laughs> <laughs> what did he say? Uh, he said something weird just to be a man that I didn't like. And I never called him again. You know? Absolutely. But uh, I can understand where he might have been in his mind. You know what I'm saying? He might have thought I was somebody playing with him. I don't know. I don't know how... Because some people didn't, didn't, didn't take the whole idea of a person being called Big Black, period. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, no, it's... Like... something... They, they, and I, and I later learned that in the minds of a lot of people, Big Black is derogatory. Oh, Big Black has some derogatory connotation. You understand what I'm saying? No, I don't. I'm not even aware of that. You know what I'm saying? I, I think of Big Black as a big black individual. Exactly. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. It has nothing to do with body parts or none of that stuff. Just a big black person. That's all it is. And, and, and everybody has a different take on it. And I just learned that not too long ago. Everybody got a different spin on what Big Black is, what Big Black means. You know, because a lot of people make jokes. You understand, with, 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 with Big Blacks and Big Black terms, they take the whole big call the computer. <laughs> Look and see how many Big Blacks on there and how, how many ways people use it. You understand what I'm talking about? But, uh, I think I think I that I, I to me it's to me, I think you wanted to you wanted to uh, you wanted to con right yeah but I don't know what Yeah. 
I'm gonna go get some pussy, yeah. And that was the terminology in those days. And 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 and, uh, and a lot of the um, a lot of the the the, 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 the parlors they used to call them in those days. You understand? Which was the downstairs um, to an upstairs whorehouse. You understand? It was called the jazz parlor. And these musicians, these black musicians, they had nowhere else to play. Because Congo Square had been outlawed. You understand? Know so mm -hmm. the music went from the street inside. You see what I'm saying? So, so the only place to play was the jazz parlors and the parlor of the jazz house. So all the black artists were, 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 became, in the white community, uh, jazz house coons. And, and you can go, you can go on the internet. Or you can go to the library and pick up sheet music from the days when they printed music, uh, cool music, they call it, with a, with a, with a, with a, um, uh, 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 comic strip version of a black person on the cover of the music sheet, dressed in a top hat, you know what I'm saying, and a red coat, and you know what I'm saying, all of that shit. That, all of that shit relates to jazz. You see what I'm saying? The feeling that was 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 that, that the people had um, for the music that they supposed to love so much today. You understand the music that more white cats are getting rich off today than black cats. Have always been that way. You understand? Blacks never made a dime from jazz. I mean, busy all of those cats you thought was making money. They made a little money. You understand? But they weren't making the kind of money they should have made. You know what I'm saying? And I know that. I saw how they lived. They had a good life, but they didn't have a great life. And for what they did, what they brought to the music scene, they should have all had a great life. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, what do you think of Duke Ellington playing back-to-back -back with the average white band? You understand? And they're paying the average white band 90 grand a night and giving Duke Ellington 20 grand for his big magnificent band. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. This, that's what I'm talking about, the difference between the music and this whole commercial aspect of what America has always been. Uh, you understand? Who spends the most money, who draws the most money, makes the most money. It has nothing to do with how long you've been in the business or what you bring to it as a genius. You know what I'm saying? You don't make a dime unless you get average white families, obviously, drawing $90,000 of the people in the room. You understand know what I'm saying? Duke Gellington was drawing $20,000 a night with them in the room. And that was the difference. How did Dizzy, how did Dizzy uh, talk about, he didn't use the word jazz, but he just called it bebop? How did he rationalize that term that obviously got kind of jaded with the idea that somehow it was good? never used it. The Duke never used it. Dizzy didn't use it. Dizzy used it. Dizzy plays bebop. Yeah, right. You understand what I'm saying? Right, right, right. I never heard Dizzy use the term jazz and related it to his music. I, I have never heard that. I have other people think of it as jazz. You see, the layman, the average American, they don't know any better. No. A lot of the foreigners, they don't know any better because they don't know how the term started. You know? They just see that because in the 1950s, when the music began to get some respect, that's when they changed the spelling of it from J-A-S-S -S to J-A-Z-Z. -Z. You see what I'm saying? Can you step back for one minute? Because I, I, I know what you're saying. Step back for a minute and talk about journalists, writers, and A&R and &A &R guys, and, and producers that, that, that um, helped... Put you know changing the last two letters on the on the on the word is one thing, but also elevating the status of true leadership in the African American community. We talk about Freddie Hubbard and Miles. Who, some of those journalists helped shape some of that. It, it, it turned that ignorance into better positive public opinion about what the music is. How did they do that? 
Well, who wrote the liner notes? I want to explain what the real terminology of jazz meant, and that it had nothing really to do with the music, other than some derogatory shit that somebody put on the music. You see what I'm saying? They never explained that. They're not going to explain anything that's going to make money for them. Nobody um, does. That's, that's, what, that's, the whole, that's the whole American trip. You understand? Everybody's into what they're into, and they'll do anything to preserve whatever it is that's feeding them. You see what I'm saying? Uh, ma- maybe. Jazz. Maybe. Jazz is making them big money. Jazz is giving them lots of stories to tell. Jazz, that's all they need is a term. But they don't know where that term came from and how many people that term hurt. You understand how many black people it hurt? Didn't hurt the white cats because it was the white cats that took jazz and turned it into big money. For well, I'll, I'm gonna count. I'm gonna challenge you, Black, on this because you like to be challenged. I'll tell you right now: the skipper Henry Franklin, when he joined Hugh Masekela, and they went out and they they cut grazing in the grass in the late '60s. They hey, were. Man, I was in the band. Of course you were. I was in the band at the same time. Me and Henry was in the band. Of course you. were in the band together. Yeah, and, and you know what? And let me, but let me. But, but what Henry told me was they made a lot of money, and they all spent it, and went, and, and they went back and started had to cut a new, and they had to go back to back to the drawing board again. But the point is, I mean, if you if you if you cut something, hey, hey, hold it. We didn't make a lot of money in that band. Master Killer and Stuart Levine made a lot of money. We didn't make a lot of money. You understand what I'm saying? See, like if we were in a band like the Rolling Stones or like any of those big white rock bands where everybody made money. Rapper Killer and Stuart Levine made the money. We didn't make a dime. Okay? Now you know. From black. You didn't make it you didn't make a dime. Nothing. Jump fucking change. We were paid. This is, this is, this is... That's why I eventually left the band, and all the other cats eventually left. Because when they realized they weren't going to make any money, that's when they all started buying out. Okay, so... So, so the whole band was about Master Killer. Understood. I, I, this is fantastic, and I, 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 I want to... Uh, keep going here. You you were treated much better on the West Coast. I'm still waiting to find that one person who hooked in. I mean, you made those. I know those. You made those albums for Uni. Someone had to recognize you. I'm not sure if you got paid, but I sure hope that the West Coast treated you better than 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 than, than, than the East Coast. Hey man, it was the same old trip. You understand? When I when I when I when I went to work for Uni, the understand I'm saying a guy over there named Axel Rod. Yep. He robbed me. You understand what I'm saying? Because you didn't put him, he was supposed to do arrangements for my band. He never wrote one arrangement. I did all of my own arrangements. He collected and kept my money. And I didn't learn that they had paid him all of that money for me until a few months ago. There was a guy over in Europe doing a piece on Axelrod, and I came into the picture, and he called my manager to get some information on me, and it was then that he told my manager what had happened. When um, I was supposed to have been getting arrangements done by Axelrod, and when I did my own arrangement, Axelrod didn't even tell me about any arrangement. You understand what I'm saying? I just put my own stuff together. And he went and collected money. And he kept all of my money. And he's living in Europe right now, arranging and making money. Black, do you, Black, do you think that, I mean, I, I, I haven't met you personally, but I know that, you know, you, what you see is what you get. Do you think that 
there was a, a lot of poor community. It sounds like a lot of poor communication. You finding out after the fact. There was no poor communication. It was just that I trusted people that couldn't be trusted. Simple as that. Or did they? I or did? Or did they? Be or did they? Were they? Any time you put your trust in somebody, you understand they take your kindness for weakness. They use you. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. I don't. I don't want to go. That's too cynical, man. I don't know, man. I, it's too cynical. That's the truth. I'm telling you, man. You can call it what you like. I'm telling you what happened. <laughs> That's what happened. If somebody's doing the best, but I mean, it okay. was a rotten. Let me tell you, the music business always was and still is a rotten business. You understand? They have rented the computer when a lot of them record companies went out of business. That's the best thing that could happen. Because they weren't doing nothing. And, and even the ones that exist today, they're all looking to get over on somebody. These producers. Some of these producers. Some of these producers are rotten. Back in the day, the producers used to go, they had, they had the, the ones that was, was, was the shysters that were making all of the money. Like that one that went to jail the other day for killing that woman. Right. The name, uh, yeah, I, I know you're talking about, it was a while ago. Yeah. Yeah, I know yeah. you're talking, yeah, it'll come to me. I just, uh, I know you're, I know you're talking yeah. about. Anyway, anyway, in those days, a producer could go into the record company. They could see a group. They could see a group in a club playing somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. And they they know right away whether this group can can bring in X amount or can excite a record company enough to get some money. So they would just, you know what I'm saying, go out and have a little rap with the group, get the group to um, um, submit to a, some kind of representation. And they would go to the record company, take them a tape of the music, let the record company hear the music, and, 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 and the record company give them about 125 grand a front to produce the band. They go give the band 25 grand to let the band produce itself. They just sit there in the chair. You understand? And that's how they made their money. They're sitting on 100 grand and the, and the whole band to 25 grand to do the record gig and pay themselves. That's how it went. That was the order of the day back in the sixties. You know what I'm saying? Because of because of the fact that you and everybody got robbed. I got robbed on that album record to our ancestors. If you notice on that record, every tune in there got somebody else's name other than mine on it. That's right. <clears throat> and he had never written a tune in his life. And I and I had so much trust in that guy, I never even noticed that his name was on all of the tunes. Until years later, Did, if you and I never, I, I, and, and, and that was one of my best records, and uh, the only money I got from that record was the advance money. I never got any royalties from it because he stole it all because he had his name on all the tunes. Black, you've been, you've been. Uh, this has been your demeanor and your your point of view and your state of mind for many, many years. This is a fact. It, and I'm not. I'm not, not disputing. No, I'm. You got to let me talk. I got. I ask the questions. You can give us the knowledge. I. I. My thing is, if to me, I'm getting two different still. It's the. It, it's the love and the and the camaraderie of the musicianship. But I also feel your blunt honesty, your blunt realism about the music industry. It's real, man. Hey, but let me tell you. No, but I hold. I got No, no. There's, there's, there's a question. There's a question here. Do you? I ain't going nowhere. Do you? Do you think? <laughs> Do you think that that your bluntness uh, uh, ostracized you even more, like from the Hollywood and Motown scene, from being a, a, a session cat? Because Nothing ostracized me. If, 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 if I don't like something, I don't be a part of it. Right, Sometimes right. Sometimes it takes take you a while to realize you don't like something. Right. You be in it for a while, and then when you realize you don't like it, you get out of it. I dig, I dig. That's not with me. I dig. When I realized I didn't care for something or that it wasn't right, I got out. You know, and I didn't, I didn't have no hard feelings about it. I just got out. You dig it? Accept whatever happened to me and, and, and move on. And I've been moving on ever since. The, uh, 
one of the classic. I, got, I hold no animosity, in other words, man. Well, yeah, and, and you know, yeah, I mean, it's it's complicated, and believe you, you I know you, I know you, you live through it. I, 1974, the the uh, Power of Soul, uh, a, a picture of Danny Ray, Big Black, hammering before the uh, famous uh, boxing fight. But was it between Ali and Fr the uh, Foreman and and Ali? That was in Africa. Yeah. Can we talk about how that even? Or how you fit into that, and, and were you friends with those guys, and, and how how did you fit into that? Because I I mean that's one of the more that's one of those clips that stands out, and you say, my gosh, you just get out of the way and watch this guy pound. When we when uh, when when John King put together the fight for um, for Zion in nineteen seventy four. He and Stuart Levine obviously got together and decided they would do a, a big festival as a prelude to the fight. Because this was going, they were going to, they were going to get a lot of money from uh, Mobutu to sponsor this whole thing. Right. And, uh, there were several sponsors involved in that, in that whole scene. There was a guy from uh, Liberia that was later killed in a plane crash and who had put up, was well, supposed to put up a million dollars to, um, to put the fight on, to promote the fight. And the, and, 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 the, and, the, and the salaries and the stuff, the 10 million, that was going to be paid, was going to be paid by Mobutu. So there were, so there were several facets, facets of this whole aggregation that they were building. And Stuart Levine, who was a young, dashy producer back then, coming off a hit record with Massa Killer, he decided that they would sort of put together the biggest festival that Africa has ever had. And, uh, and they pulled it off. You got Chipmunk and all of the top cats in the business. Chipmunk is, I don't know if Chip is still around now, but Chipmunk was one of the top cats for um, setting up um, outdoor arenas for, 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 you know, he worked for the Rolling Stones, all of the top rock groups in this country. After that time, he was the top man, you know, for setting up the stage and all of that. So sure. had to go to Africa, build a stage. They did the whole nine yard, man. They went there and brought in a crane, did all kinds of things. And, and they ran into lots and lots of money. And uh, their calculations was real because they began to think that they were in another country other than Africa. See, they made a big mistake in Africa because in Africa nobody had any money. And they, were, they, they, were, they were relying on people coming to Africa from other places to support this festival. Anyway, they put all the entertainers together, and I was part of that group. You know, James Brown, born your old stars, so Italian Cruz, uh, myself, uh, Mano de Bongo, out of Africa. Then they had a lot of African groups. They had the Pointer Sisters, um, uh, Sister Slade, uh, the Spinner, E.B. King. You understand know what I'm saying? This was a big, big, big rock, a multi-million dollar project. And uh, that's how I became a part of it. And I was originally scheduled to uh, perform with um, Mano de Bongo to do it and set these things up. But Mano de Bongo had never heard me play. And uh, he had his skeptics about me. So he decided that he would rather have somebody like Ray Barretto play with him. And um, that's how it went down. So when I had somebody to play with, I just simply went to it and said, look, man, Bob of the Bob will just not want to play with me. Put me on the lawn. 
folks, welcome back to part two with Big Black. And uh, so at this point, can you talk a little bit more about uh, the, the connotation of jazz, how it went from J-S-S-S to J-A-Z-Z? Jazz became 
jazz is what it is. That's why people like Duke Ellington and Dizzy Gillespie and all those cats, they never call their music jazz. Dizzy, that's why Dizzy and, and Bird and those created Bebop to get away from the whole jazz thing because they were, they were aware. You understand? Zach Moore Armstrong, he didn't give a goddamn because he was making money. You understand? And, he, you know, with, 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 with that, with that, with that, what I call meagerly grin that he had. You understand what I'm saying? Although I love the motherfucker. You understand what I'm saying? He, he, he used the term jazz. Jazz. Yes. <laughs> Frank Sinatra and all them cats. Right. All that old Uncle Tom shit. You understand what I'm saying, man? Now, all of that was a put down to me, at least. I don't know how other blacks felt about it, but I, I, it was a put down to me as a black individual. You know what I'm saying? And I, I really didn't want to have anything to do with it. So I never did any jazz albums. Everything that I played that was called jazz, I played it with other people. But my own personal music was never jazz. Talk, black. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Talk, talk about what you, what term you would like to, what you used for your music that you made. I'm telling you now. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize for my language. You don't have to apologize. I can't. I can't talk about that. 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 All of that. All of that garbage that went on back then, without using some kind of profanity, it seemed to fit fit the whole subject matter. But um, when I started, when I when I became active in music, yes, and I was aware because I researched and I read, uh, and the blues was always the basis of everything I did. Like the blues was the basis of all of the music. You understand what I'm saying? It was no jazz. It was progressive. It was blues. All of it, all that early stuff that that was played in the jazz houses was the blues. You understand? Came out of the blues. You dig it? And, uh, and, 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 I don't know, maybe the blues in those days, uh, in the minds of, 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 of the, um, of all of the, all of the, all of the, all of the white promoters was maybe that was bad connotation in their mind. So they had to come up with a new term or something. Anyway, jazz grew out of that. But as far as my music is concerned, I always consider what I'm playing as progressive blues, which all of the music was progressive blues, right down to what Dizzy and those were doing. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Everybody was playing progressive blues. Dizzy came up with the term bebop, you understand? Duke never called his music uh, blues, you understand? And I see it as the music of the artist that's playing it. You know, John Coltrane, the music of John Coltrane. Not John Coltrane and his jazz this, or his ain't no jazz nothing. Jazz ain't got nothing to do with music. Jazz is a negative connotation. I don't care how they spell it. You understand? Our music is progressive blues. You understand what I'm saying? Progressive blues. If you listen to Monk, Randy Weston, all of the great players, you understand? Uh, I mean, from A to Z, these cats were playing the blues, you understand? Now there's a few cats that came along later on <clears throat> that, that took the classical themes, you understand what I'm saying, and put it over into that idiom, you understand what I'm saying? You think it, uh, and they begin to call that jazz, you know what I'm saying? Like right now they got this thing called cool jazz, you understand? Hey, <laughs> there's no such music, cool jazz. Yeah, it's cool jazz, I guess, to those who's playing it and who like it. You understand what I'm saying? Because the term jazz has is, is got them all hooked. But I always hated the term, you understand? And I don't tell nobody that I play jazz. If a jazz group call me, if I play with certain guys, you understand, whatever they call their music, that's their business, you know what I'm saying? And I don't be trying to indoctrinate them or turn them around from doing anything because the moment you say something about jazz, some guys get violently upset about it. Because they think you're talking about the music. When you're talking about jazz, you're not talking about music. You're talking about a bad word. You understand? Something that's negative. Something that makes you look bad. If the rest but since the whole world now has accepted it, it don't make you look bad because when you say jazz, everybody approves. You know what I'm saying? And that's all one needs is approval. You understand? But I know better. You understand what I'm saying? And anytime somebody approves of it, it pisses me off. Can you can you talk about 
uh, working with a, a true blues man, uh, a guy uh, that always thought outside the box. And there's a, I'm looking at a picture on the album of uh, Paul Butterfield. Sometimes I feel like. Yeah. Yeah, can, I remember Paul. Can you? You know, I just contacted his son the other. He's got a son that lives down in uh, Florida. Really. Yeah, I just, I just, I just contact. Well, I didn't. I got a friend that contacted him, and we were supposed to get together to do something. He's, he's doing some things down there, out of his house. He's got a little spot down there, and I'm gonna hook up with, with Paul Butterfield Jr. one day. Yeah, I enjoyed working with Paul Butterfield Blues Band. Can you talk about what made that band uh, special in the sense that uh, where what was Paul's background and, and how he seemed to... Well, I don't, you know, so man, frankly, I don't know anything about Paul's background or even the guy that was in the band. They called me one day for the gig, you understand? Uh, we weren't, we weren't, we didn't hang out, uh -huh. you know, we lived on, in, in different areas of the city, you know what I'm saying? And they was always on tour, because Paul had a set group. You understand? They just brought me on for that particular album. They had heard about me. They, he probably had heard my music and had liked what I was doing and felt that I would be good for what he was doing. I went and I did the album, and that was the last time I saw Paul. Paul passed away a few years ago, and I, I never, I, I never, ne never really got to know him, other than through doing that record. Like I said, man, I played with everybody. Yeah, I played with a lot of cats that call their music jazz. You understand? Because I'm not defined by that, you know? Mm -hmm. People go on there, they hear me, they say, well, that's big black. Because my style is unique, and, uh, and people recognize it. And uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't hold any grudges against the musicians out there that are calling their music jazz today because they don't know any better. You understand? Some of them do know better. But some of them don't care because all they want to do is get in on something that's making some money. But jazz ain't never made no black person rich. I don't know. No rich black dude that's got over on jazz. All the rich people that got over on jazz is white. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like all of the big record companies like Blue Note and all those record companies. They, they, made, they made billions of dollars on jazz and still making it on jazz. You understand what I'm saying? This guy got this program. And people like Britton Marcellus, you understand? He is exploiting, you know what I'm saying? He, 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 he's into the jazz thing. You understand what I'm saying? Because of making money for him, he's being recognized. He's being paid millions of dollars. He runs um, Lincoln Center. You understand what I'm saying? Jazz is good to him. You know, they don't give a goddamn whether it's, 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 it's asshole music as long as it's making them some money. You understand what I'm saying? I just, so, you know, so, so it, these guys that are out there, you understand, they, they, are, they, they become a part of the exploiters, you understand, of the music, you understand, with a negative connotation on it. No, do you, like, this thing has been layered for, it's been going on for decades, and you're one of the, one of the first guys I've been able to talk to that really came up in the New York jazz scene uh, you know, with Dizzy and, and, you know, one of the first albums you appeared on was with, uh, was with Freddie Hubbard. And I, I just think to myself, I, you know, why did, why did that label stick? Um, it was, I know it was merely, for, but I mean, it was, it was for labels. People could find what they were looking for in record stores, but I can't see why all these people like Freddie Hubbard and, 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 uh, why they would even stand to put up with it, and and, and uh, I guess it was just a, it was a, it was more of a label thing. I'm telling you, man, it wasn't the artist that applied the jazz to the music; it was the promoters, right? Because jazz jazz became an idiom in, a, in and of itself, right? Jazz, right. like it is today. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So if, you, if you're doing if you if you're playing heavy music, anything that's slick, you understand? Like bebop, you understand what I'm saying? Like progressive blues. That became jazz because that idiom, you understand, focus people who's going to buy the music. You understand? They want, they want to buy some jazz. They don't want, you know what I'm saying? You don't hear people say, I'm going to go out and buy me some bebop album. They say, I'm going to go out and buy a jazz album. You don't hear them say, I'm going to go and get a progressive blues album. They'll go out and say, I'm going to go buy some blues by B.B. King or some of those older cats that were playing the pure blues. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They, but they, 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 wanted that, they wanted a category. Everything is categorized. Like right. Pop. Right. You understand? Know right. Like, uh, like 
R&B. You know what I'm saying? R&B. Another term that is that 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 that, that could have been used for the heavy music. You understand? Progressive R&B, progressive blues. You understand what I'm saying? No, they gotta take some old copulating word like jazz and apply it to the music, and and it caught on. That's the thing. Uh, see, three, three letter syllables is easy. Jazz. That's easy to remember. You understand what I'm saying? It became it became a part of of life. You understand? Because as you know, man, this jazz is is international, worldwide. You can't go nowhere on this planet. You understand what I'm saying? And don't find some jazz. And I can tell you this right now. The only cats that's making any money off jazz today is the white cats. Blacks ain't making shit off of jazz. You know what I'm saying? I don't know no black artist that, that call their music jazz that's making any money. You think... Like what about like, what about a guy like making a little money, but ain't nobody making no money of 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 any of any uh uh of any uh of any uh subsequent. If you look back on it, instead of uh, what it, what was a bigger problem, the fact that the promoters labeled it jazz, or the fact that yeah, no 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 but no 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 promoters labeled it jazz and they exploited it. But there's another there's, there's another they, factor and, here. And, and instead of and, and as they exploited it, you understand. They were taking it away from the blacks. You understand what I'm saying? They leave. They left us poor, high and dry. Took our fucking style, our concept. You understand? Put the jazz title on it, and now the white cats are making all the money. The blacks ain't making shit. But what was? What were the black unions like back then? And what was the education? They never had no union that was black. We had. There was a time when they had the segregated union, but. That, that wasn't amount to he was shit. What, talk about the segregated unions, because I kind of got the impression that when they desegregated the unions, it hurt black artists, because it, it limited their ability to really... What I feel that, you know, in my research, when, they, when, there were, when there were segregated unions, when you had a black union, you could actually yeah. stand and make a claim to what you're saying. Forget this jazz coon stuff, it's just called... I'm telling you now, man, I'm telling you now, they were indoctrinated, a lot, a lot of black cats was totally indoctrinated into the whole jazz thing, mm-hmm. because they thought it was a means to make money, Right. but they wasn't going to make shit, right. you understand what I'm saying, uh-huh. the, the deck was stacked against them from the get-go, you understand what I'm saying, no matter what they did, they wasn't going to make no money, you understand what I'm saying, all these young cats coming up like, uh, what is this cool jazz artist, the trumpet player, what's his name? But like Kenny G? No, not Kenny G. I don't. I don't listen to smooth. Trumpet player, trumpet player. Kenny G is a is a, is a, is a soprano player. Yeah, I don't. I yeah, you got me on that. I don't know. I don't listen to smooth anyway, jazz. Anyway, anyway, all of the top, all of the top white jazz artists. You understand? If you go to see them in concert, they charge one hundred and fifty dollars to see them for a ticket. One hundred and fifty, two hundred and fifty dollars to see them. You understand what I'm saying? Hey. You don't see no black cats getting that kind of money. You understand? You dig it? These cats make millions of dollars. You understand what I'm saying? And when a black cat go out to play, they want to pay you, throw you a couple hundred bucks. You understand what I'm saying? Hey, man, it's a terrible, terrible situation. It's terribly unjust. It's not right. You understand? And all, and, 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 and we are the creators of the music. You understand? Absolutely. The music has been stolen. From us. Absolutely. But they can't steal our music, but our concept has been stolen. You understand? The white cats are taking it. They're making millions and millions of dollars, big, big, big bucks, and the black cat can't even get paid. Man, they don't even recognize. But you know something, though? I can understand that in the sense that we are the minorities in this country. You understand what I'm saying? And one thing I find about white people, they support their own. They support their artists. So when an artist, when an artist like, um, what's this cat name? I can't think of his name right now. Go on stage, you understand? He's got an arena full of white people that can afford to pay $150, $200 for a ticket. That's how they make all that big money. You understand what I'm saying? So, so, so they don't even have a second group that could be black. For every white group that's making that kind of money, I figure if they wanted to be, uh, supportive of us as black, 
black musicians, as the creators of the musicians, of the music that they are making money from, they should have at least have us as a second ticket. You don't even see that shit. We ain't second to nothing. We get nothing. We are left out. Period. You know, in our first interview, I'm not mad. but 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 can you pay a little I'm not bit of? Mad. You know what? I, you know what makes me happy to see what the music can do if it was done fairly. I know that there's money in the music. You understand? But it's the unfairness of the of the of the of the big promoters. You understand? They don't. They're not interested in us as musicians. They're interested in our concept so that they can take it and glorify themselves. There's also a dumbing down of the music, though, as well. I mean, when you compare it to the sophistication of of Dizzy and and Bird, Felonious, and you know these other cats, even the you know they this smooth jazz concept is very light and it's very appealing to it's very surface oriented, which is very good for a, a lot of white First people. Of all, it's not a jazz concept. You understand what I'm saying? That's what I'm talking about. You see? Not a jazz concept. The concept, jazz was applied to the concept. It, it is a, it, 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 well, to, to white people it's a jazz concept because they're the ones that created the jazz terminology, all the negative shit, and they're the ones that's making the money. Everything that we created now has become a jazz concept, but it was never a jazz concept. You understand what I'm saying? It was a progressive blues concept. Right. Because what they called jazz grew out of the blues. You understand? The sophistication of it was how the black cats applied it. How, how, how they took the blues and did other things with it. You understand what I'm saying? Black, I want, but I want to give you, I want to, I, I want to, this is. Now they can take classical music and put it into the same idiom and, you understand, and call it jazz. Uh, but I, I want to be, you know, this is a, uh, this is an interview that will go on the air, and I want to talk to you not just about what, what happened, but what in your mind should have been done. Okay, what, what were the alternatives? Should have been done. We should have been dealt with fairly. We should have been given our profits. But that has nothing to do with the, 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 But that doesn't have anything to do with changing the vernacular. I mean, what kind of words would you use instead of you want to call you want like K jazz in Los Angeles with K bebop. K progressive blues. Know, like I said, man, that 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 has been that is done. Now, I mean, it's nothing I can do about it. What should have been done? Nobody can do about it because it's now it has it, 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 been embedded in the minds of the whole the whole world. Right. You understand? Right. Jazz is in. Jazz is in. Jazz is a is a concept. You understand? And, 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 and the word black is not even applied, and I'm glad the word black is not applied to it. You understand what I'm saying? Jazz is a white music now. It's not a black music. It's a white music. Jazz. So Ron Carter says black classical music. How does that sit with you? Black classical is beautiful. Black classical music. I mean, I, I, you know, those terminology things are... That's what most of the New York cats call it. Black classical. And that's what it is. It's black classical music. But it is. it grew out of the blues. All of it is the blues. Of course. I mean... 90%, 99% of the black music is blues. You understand what I'm saying? <coughs> From, it was W.C. Handy who structured, who put the European changes to the blues. Because the original blues is how it's played in Texas. There was no changes. Shit grew out of chance. You understand? There was no changes, per se. There was changes, but the changes wasn't focused on you understand? What they, they focus on the groove. You understand what I'm saying? The blues is a groove. You understand? And you get on top of that groove with your horn, and you just blow whatever comes to your mind. You understand what I'm saying? You didn't, you didn't focus. But W.C. Handy, he was the cat that put the European changes, the one, four, five changes, and all that stuff, to the blues. You see? And now, and, and, and then, and then all the other black cats picked it up and started progressing from that point. You understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. You know, I, in our first interview, you made a comment, and it caught my attention. You talked about your brother and his partner, and you, uh, 
you, you were they were your mentors and then you actually said you said I just took it a step further I, I, I you know I, I'm living longer and I'm, I'm actually putting my own accent on it can you talk to the audience about what what you're doing to progress black classical music in your mind well you might say that I am the original uh Progressive blues congoist. Some people would call call me a jazz congo drummer. You understand? But I call myself the bebop drummer. Uh -huh. I'm a bebop drummer. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? And I'll tell you a story. One night I was playing with Dizzy at the Blue Note in New York. And he gave me a solo. And as I am playing, Dizzy was standing just to the side or to the right of me, listening to me play. You know what I'm saying? And all of a sudden, out of the clear blue sky, Dizzy turned around and looked at me. Because when I play, when I play, you can't hear a pin drop in the audience. Because I don't play like those Afro Cubans. I don't play to get people to scream, you understand, with my antics and, and my hand movements and all of that old. <laughs> All that old showbiz bullshit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm an artist. I, I approach everything I do like 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 the most like like Salvador Dali or some of those badass artists painters out there. I played and I want people to listen to what I'm playing. I don't want people to applaud. I don't want to hear no noise. And the way I play, I get that kind of attention. Anyway, this particular night. Dizzy gave me a solo, and I'm deep into my solo. And all of a sudden, Dizzy broke the silence. He turned around and looked at me and said, Now I know what you're playing, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> he said, You're playing bebop. Wow. Wow. That wasn't news to me. <laughs> I was playing bebop. But it took Dizzy 20 some years of playing with me to realize that I was playing what he created on conga drums had never been done before. Dizzy liked to play congas too, though. Uh, of course. Yeah. He was a conga drummer, but Dizzy was an Afro-Cuban conga drummer. That's right. He played in the tradition of Chano Bozo. I'm a non-traditionalist. I didn't play like nobody. You understand what I'm saying? The origin of the way I played began in the Fiji Islands with the Fuzzy Wuzzy. <laughs> you know what, Black? You have so much info. No, I, I, I'm not going to sit here and say I know what you're, where I'm coming from because I did not. I did. I didn't. I didn't live through it. But it, it, I. I mean, you're making it. You're painting a really nice picture, and I just think that. Hey, man, this is the truth. This is this is how it happened. You see, because when I when I began to research my mentors and where they got what they were doing from, because. I am a product of them, you know, because it's, it's all passed on, you know what I'm saying? If I create something, there's going to be other guys that like what I do, and they're going to take it to another level. I took what my brother and his partner was doing to another level, to the level I got it right now. You understand what I'm saying? I can play the most sophisticated music on the planet, just with my style, my concept. You understand? There's no limit to it. You understand? It's like art. It's art. And, 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 and it's still in form. You know what I'm saying? It's coming straight from the cosmos to me, to the drum. You see what I'm saying? Absolutely. It's not contrived. I'm not thinking Afro-Cuban. I'm not thinking Africa. I'm not thinking anything. I'm only thinking me. I have developed a uh, technique. You understand? And a concept. I'm playing off of a concept that was developed by my brother and his partner. And I've taken it to another level. You understand? It's highly sophisticated. You understand? It's not easy. You understand what I'm saying? It's art. You understand? It's easy in the sense that if I'm teaching a student to play what I do, or to play the way I play, or the concept of what I'm doing, not the way I play, because I don't teach people to play like me. I teach them to play like they feel. I want a student to play what he feels. I just give him the tools of how to develop 
the technique, the physical technique, use of hands, you understand? You can't teach a person how to think. You can tell them what to think, you understand? But a person's going to think the way they want to think no matter what, unless they become a robot or somebody that just can't do nothing unless they learn. And there are some people like that, you understand what I'm saying? They, 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 no matter what you teach them, you understand? They know some people can only learn what, can, can do what they are taught. Some people can't go into their own mind because they, they lose it somewhere along the way. You understand? I play strictly from my mind. And every time you hear me play it, listen, it never sounds the same twice. You understand what I'm saying? That's an artist. I want to go back. I want to go back. Constantly changing in your mind as you play, as you grow, as you progress. When you were playing in the Bahamas, when you were playing at that club that was run by the German and the Jew, the guy Simon. Yes, yes. Don't, 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 they they weren't chumps. I mean, they they treated you well, though. I mean, I want I want to find out about John one. Sala, John Sala was a great person. He was an artist. He was a sculptor, right? And a painter, a builder. What I'm trying. I just. I him out of play concerts before he died. I just want to know about some. He was one of my best friends. I want to know about some of those 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 friends of yours that treated you well in the, in the industry. Aside from the, schm- uh, not the schmucks from the major record company. Nobody in the industry treated me well. Nobody. To this day. You understand? Because they think that because my name, because I'm called Big Black, that I'm some kind of white-hating, subversive individual. I ain't about that, man. I'm a peacemaker. You understand what I'm saying? And later on, I'm going to give you a dot com to go to because I want you to become a peacemaker. That's right. No, I mean, I can I can feel that through and through, through your music, through our conversations, through the people, you know, I guess, I guess I'm about also portraying an idea here that, you know, I'm, I'm a white American, part European, Jewish, but I look at myself and I say, you know, part of our culture, part of our, our society now just has a really hard time with the facts and with the idea of where the roots of certain things came from, and then giving credit to the race that actually created it, whether it's bebop, whether it's um, education, and it's a lot easier to tear down those minorities. I believe, I believe that. I believe that if 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 the whole concept of Hey Black. Hey, listen. I got a I got a five month old baby that just woke up from a nap. So um, I'm gonna keep editing this. I, this is great, and uh, and I, I hear you, brother, and I I love your emotion, and I wish I could have seen you play. I wish I could see, see have seen you play over the last forty years, man. Just and I would have kept my mouth shut the whole time. Hey man, I'm still playing. I'm better now than I was ever been. Yeah, but you know. I I, 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 but who, you know, we, we need, we need you to get paid too. That's the thing. Hey, I'm not going to even worry about that either because there are other ways to make money. This is America. You understand what I'm saying? You dig it? 
I dig it. I dig it, Black. Hey, I need I need it. Do you do you, do you have an email address that you check? Huh? Do you have an email address that you check? Here's what I want you to do. Yeah. Write this down. 